Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Terry. Um, can everybody hear me? Yeah? Good. Um, uh, it's really great to be home in Baltimore, uh, and I'm delighted to be here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, this city, uh, this school, uh, the Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, uh, have actually meant a tremendous amount uh, to, to my family. Um, my mother's father was born in Baltimore and uh, grew up uh, actually in uh, one of the city's few integrated neighborhoods. Uh, it was uh, African American and Jewish. And what that meant was that his first lessons in English, I uh, grew up in a Yiddish speaking home, uh, first lessons in English uh, were from his African American neighbors. Uh, and these lessons, re really they were his first lessons in being American. And they stayed with my grandfather for his entire life. Uh, even after he went to Johns Hopkins for college and eventually became a lawyer in town, uh, he continued to think about America through the lens of black and white and to measure our progress as a nation uh, by whether these categories continue to define status and opportunity and acceptance. So it's always a thrill to be able to talk about my book here uh, where its deep roots lie. Uh, so I'm going to try to talk for about uh, uh, 30, 40 minutes or so uh, uh, about some of the general points that I make in my book. Uh, and I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for, for discussion. Uh, but I, I want to start by talking about something that I encountered in my research but didn't wind up in the book. So in 1927, a Radcliffe graduate student named Carolyn Bond Day, this is, this is uh, Ms. Day, uh, began working on her anthropology master's thesis on mixed race families in the United States. And the subject had a personal resonance for Day. Uh, she was a fixture in Atlanta uh, of what was known as colored society. And she had a complexion that defied easy categorization. To gather data for her thesis, she wrote to dozens of men and women uh, in her large circle of friends. And among them were people who were known as leaders of the race, uh, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, John Hope, who was the first African-American president of Atlanta University, uh, and Walter White. And she asked for exhaustive genealogies from them uh, with estimates of blood proportion, uh, Negro, white, and Indian, uh, for each ancestor. She provided a detailed questionnaire uh, about their physical features uh, from uh, uh, eye and skin color to the fullness of their lips. And uh, she requested family portraits whenever possible and uh, as many locks of hair uh, as people could collect. And the results wound up in a remarkable book uh, uh, published in the early 1930s uh, called The Study of Some Negro White Families in the United States. Now, Day was capable of speaking about race with an almost absurd degree of scientific precision. So one year earlier, uh, the National Urban League had given her a prize for an autobiographical short story called The Pink Hat. And this was a story about a young woman who discovers that one of her hats covers her hair in such a way and uh, casts a, a glow on her skin uh, in, in such a way that most people at first glance think she's white. And near the start, uh, Day described the story's main character as, uh, this is Day's words, anthropologically speaking, a dominant of the white type of the F3 generation of secondary crossings. But she was also capable of using more accessible taxonomies. So when she asked her research subjects to describe the texture of their hair, she gave them a range of options. Was it straight? Was it wavy? Curly? Or was it something in between wavy and curly? And that intermediate category 
uh, was what Day called frizzly. <laughs> so frizzly. Uh, I'd never seen that word before, uh, before I found it in her writing. And, you know, make no mistake, uh, uh, on a humid day, uh, when I'm a couple weeks overdue for a haircut, uh, my hair gets frizzy. Uh, but there's something different uh, about that extra L. Uh, you know, frizzly, it, it was a designation that was supposed to be scientific, uh, but at the same time, it felt homemade uh, and improvised. You know, reading through uh, Carolyn Bondé's manuscripts, I was astonished at the richness of the correspondence and uh, the, the portrait that emerged of a group of educated African Americans who were keenly aware of the absurdities of the color line, uh, but still bound by Jim Crow uh, in its most ossified and oppressive forms. Yet, my thoughts kept, kept coming back to Frizzly. Uh, so frizzly is a word that's been used in English for 500 years, uh, but no one quite knows its origin. Uh, it can suggest wildness, uh, but also purposeful chaos. So you look in the Oxford English Dictionary and you look in uh, examples from, from literature, uh, and frizzly could mean the unkempt locks of a servant girl, uh, but also the wig of a respected government official. You know, people tried to control their frizzly hair, and then they frizzled it just so. So physical anthropologists used the term uh, at various points in the 19th and 20th centuries to describe the hair texture of European and Moroccan Jews, uh, Australian Aborigines, uh, various South Pacific Islanders, uh, among others. But in Day's questionnaire, uh, it wasn't just a scientific category for measuring physical types. You know, it also had to be something colloquial that the recipients of the questionnaires, you know, her friends, could readily understand. You know, wavier than wavy, uh, not exactly curly, frizzly. And as a category on the line between uh, objective and subjective, uh, abject and aspirational, uh, observed and imagined. Frisley calls into question uh, the enterprise of drawing the line between black and white. You know, what appears to be scientific reveals itself to be social. And Carolyn Bondé knew this you know, from her own experience of being mistaken for white uh, and from the experience of the family she was studying, 10% uh, of whom had members who were living as white people. You know, her meticulous documentation of mixed race families, I mean, on one level, it reinforced the notion of race as blood born and capable of precise measurement, while at the same time, it exposed the contingency, subjectivity, and uncertainty of racial categories. When Day was writing her thesis, mapping out the complex permutations of race had undeniable academic value. Uh, it opened up to academic study what her thesis advisor called the almost inaccessible class of educated persons of mixed Negro and white descent. While research like Day's had the potential to expose essential fallacies underlying American ideas about race, the study of the physical traits of people with remote African ancestry almost seemed useful, even necessary, for a world of increasingly rigid racial categories. So most southern states had adopted one-drop rules uh, during the first decades of the 20th century. These were rules that defined anyone with any African blood uh, as legally black. And in 1924, just three years before Day started her work, uh, Virginia enacted an act to preserve racial integrity uh, that uh, only defined white person to mean the person who has no trace whatsoever uh, of any blood other than the Caucasian. Uh, the, the act actually not only did that, but also uh, placed the administration of the color line in the hands of a state vital statistics agency 
that was staffed by ideologically committed eugenicists. Uh, the, the law uh, uh, had to be amended at the last moment because the way it was written, uh, many of the uh, elite Virginia families that, that claimed to be descended from Pocahontas and John Rolfe uh, would have been classified as black under the law. Uh, so they wrote in what was called the Pocahontas exception. So the following year, uh, uh, so just two years before Day started her work, uh, there were hundreds of front page headlines uh, about the sensational Rhinelander annulment trial uh, in which uh, an heir to an old Dutch New York society family alleged that he had unwittingly married a woman with colored blood. So in Day's world, I mean this is all to say, uh, a little frizzle could go a long way. Uh, it affected how people were designated on their birth and death certificates, uh, whom they could marry, where they could go to school, uh, generally what kind of social mobility they could expect, uh, and how they related to and understood the state. But the color line wasn't always so cut and dried. So over the course of American history, uh, ideas about race were constantly being made and remade. So my book reflects on the history of race, uh, a history of hard lines that were constantly shifting. By telling the story of three families across many generations and a really broad sweep of American history. So at first glance, the families couldn't be more different. Uh, one owned sugar plantations in the bayous southwest of New Orleans. Uh, the second family lived their lives as poor subsistence farmers uh, in an isolated mountain community in eastern Kentucky, you know, what we'd call an Appalachian holler. Uh, and uh, the third family, they were uh, educated professionals in Washington, D.C. But these three families, the Gibsons, the Spencers, and the Walls, each had one thing in common. They started out as people of color, and they crossed the color line. They assimilated into white communities, they identified as white, and their neighbors and the government thought of them as white too. They became white. So the first family, the, the Gibsons, uh, here, here is uh, a particularly choice example of the Gibsons. Uh, they became white in the South Carolina backcountry before the Revolution. And around 1800, they moved to Mississippi and uh, Louisiana and Kentucky and ascended to the heights of the planter elite. You know, their descendants were uh, Confederate officers. And after the war, they worked tirelessly to end Reconstruction and restore white rule to the South. So this is a man named Randall Gibson, uh, who was um, uh, the Yale valedictorian of 1853 uh, uh, came from a sugar plantation in Terrebonne Parish, Louisiana. Uh, and uh, during the war, he was a uh, brigadier general for the rebels. Uh, after the war, was elected to Congress as a Democrat from New Orleans, uh, and then became a senator uh, from Louisiana. Now, the second family, uh, the Spencers, uh, they became white in eastern Kentucky before the Civil War. And they started out poor and they stayed poor. Uh, they logged and farmed their holler uh, until they went into the coal mines. And for a better part of the century, they, they hovered on the line between black and white. Uh, so this is a uh, picture from the late 19th century of people logging in uh, the hollers in Johnson County, Kentucky. Uh, which is where they lived, um, uh, the, you know, if you, uh, it, right by the great metropolis of Paintsville, Kentucky, um, and actually very, very close to where uh, Loretta Lynn grew up. Uh, so uh, in Butcher Holler, that's in Johnson County. Then the third family, the Wall family, uh, their story uh, is perhaps the most familiar sounding. So it began with a wealthy plantation owner in North Carolina, uh, this, this fellow, Stephen Wall, uh, who never married, but had many children with three women whom he owned. But then the story becomes a little less familiar. 
the plantation owner freed his slave children uh, and sent them to Ohio to be raised by radical Quaker abolitionists. And as far as I can tell, uh, he kept their mothers in bondage. The children became ardent anti-slavery activists, uh, lawyers and teachers, and part of the rising black political class uh, in Washington, D.C. after the Civil War. Uh, this is a man named O.S.B. Wall. Uh, he, uh, when he was about 13, was sent to Ohio, uh, wound up in Oberlin, uh, uh, which right before the Civil War, uh, when Oberlin was uh, pound for pound the most abolitionist town in America. Uh, during the war, he uh, uh, recruited hundreds of soldiers for the Massachusetts 54th uh, and other African-American regiments. Uh, and after the war, he joined the Freedmen's Bureau uh, and wound up in Washington, D.C. Uh, and he was you know, part of a, a cohort that included uh, Frederick Douglass, who, who would come to his house. Uh, it also embraced, uh, he and his wife embraced women's rights, and Susan B. Anthony was a guest at their house. And his children, Wall's children, came of age during Reconstruction, and they were educated in uh, uh, Howard University's lab schools, which had the distinction of being some of the only integrated schools in Washington. And they were raised to expect the same kinds of rights and opportunities as whites. But right when they reached adulthood, Reconstruction gave way to Jim Crow, and it was like a door had slammed shut. Uh, and at the dawn of the 20th century, they traded a, the, his children traded a tradition of activism uh, and heroism uh, for anonymous lives on the other side of the racial divide. Uh, and uh, this is um, O.S.B. Wall's granddaughter uh, who was um, uh, kicked out of a white elementary school in Washington, D.C. in 1909 uh, and then sued the, the District of Columbia School Board uh, and took the stand uh, and the, uh, uh, everyone in court uh, just eyeballed her uh, to, to see whether she was white or black. Uh, she was adjudicated black uh, and at that moment uh, the walls decided that they would become the gates. Uh, and as the Gates uh, uh, and later the Murphys, they went from being African American uh, to being Irish. So together, uh, these three families, the, the Gibsons, the Spencers, and the Walls, tell a big American story. You know, they settled the colonial frontiers, they lived through the revolution, they fought in the Civil War. Uh, they migrated west on great roads that were crowded with pioneers. Uh, through booms and busts, they earned and lost and earned back their family fortunes. Uh, they witnessed the rise of the plantation economy, the coming of the railroad and industry, and the country's transformation into a modern urban society. And all the while, they experienced the wrenching transition from slavery to freedom to Jim Crow. So their story is the story of America, and more particularly, the story of race in America. And their migration across the color line reveals one of the great hidden narratives of the American experience. From the colonial era until well into the 20th century, people of color were continually assimilating into white communities. This was a mass migration that was covered up even as it was happening. So, there have always been traces of this migration scattered throughout the historical record. You can find it in scholarly accounts, in memoirs, uh, in old newspaper stories. And I found quite a number of newspaper articles. Um, uh, between 1880 and 1920, uh, it seemed that you know, every couple of weeks you could find uh, a story, you know, usually a, a short piece on an inside page in which the color line bends in some weird and fascinating way. Uh, so the editors could have filled that space with you know, what we think of the, as the usual fillers, you know, a fire, a flood, an industrial accident. Uh, but instead, we get stories like one from exactly 102 years ago today, 
in Baltimore, February 21st, 1911, when a little girl went to Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, to be examined by a doctor named John Whitridge Williams. Uh, he was dean of the medical department, uh, professor of obstetrics, uh, and had been uh, obstetrician in chief. And the girl, uh, this was an 11 year old uh, named Luella Leftridge. Uh, she wasn't there because she was sick. You know, rather, uh, Dr. Williams sought to document six things. Uh, he inspected the tint of the whites of her eyes, the curl of her hair, the shape of her nostrils. Uh, he considered whether there were any dark spots on her skin, uh, whether there was a dark line that followed the spinal cord, and whether her fingernails had bluish half moons. So Dr. Williams wasn't looking for signs of disease. Uh, he was trying to determine whether Luella Leftridge had been properly assigned to an orphanage for African American girls. You know, was she white or was she black? And you know, this happens, uh, uh, it's uh, in court, and the New York Times and the Washington Post couldn't resist devoting just a couple column inches to the story. Now beyond the newspapers, uh, Luella Leffridge was, was seeking a writ of habeas corpus uh, to get uh, released from the orphanage. And this was actually one of dozens and dozens of legal cases dating back uh, uh, to slavery, uh, where for one reason or another, uh, judges or juries had to determine whether someone was white or black. And what kind of cases were these? Um, basically, everywhere uh, that the law distinguished black from white uh, became an occasion for people to challenge their classification. Uh, so slavery was tied to African ancestry. And so you get people suing for their freedom on the ground that they're white or Native American. Uh, free people of color uh, often had to pay higher taxes in many parts of the South. Uh, so they go to court and say we shouldn't have to pay this extra money because we are not black. Uh, there are interracial marriage prosecutions where uh, uh, the classification of, of one of the spouses is at issue. Uh, either they say we're both white or they say we're both black. Uh, and on the flip side, uh, uh, husbands tried to annul their marriages uh, on the ground that they had unwittingly married black women. Uh, African Americans couldn't testify against whites, so <laughs> there are some circumstances where um, uh, people challenge witnesses who are about to take the stand uh, on the ground that they're not competent to present evidence. And in the middle of the trial, there'll be a mini trial uh, to figure out whether the witness is black or white and, and so can testify. Uh, so each of these cases, each of these sources provides a set of stories about the porous nature of the color line. Uh, but most scholars have assumed that this was a history that couldn't be recovered beyond isolated anecdotes. Now, the more time I spent over uh, the past several years researching instances of migration across the color line, the more two things became clear to me. First, that it's possible to recover quite a number of these events uh, so nowadays, there is so much historical and genealogical material that's available and searchable on the internet. And you know, there's the whole industry of DNA ancestry testing uh, that uh, it's vastly easier to research these issues. And you know, leaving aside the question of the validity of this kind of DNA testing, uh, at the very least, it's meant that more people are learning about their family histories every day, and they're talking about their ancestry in forums that are more public than they've ever been. Uh, so we know more about this phenomenon than we ever have. And I learned uh, uh, as I started collecting these stories that it's a mistake to treat instances of crossing the color line as isolated and exceptional events. You know, it's not just a New Orleans story. Uh, you know, you do some research and you realize, uh, you, you know, all along the coast, Mobile, Charleston, uh, they're very similar stories. 
And then the stories move inland, you know, to places like Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, to places like eastern Kentucky that are presumed to be the whitest places on earth, uh, and certainly to places like Baltimore. You know, these migrations occurred all over the country across time. Now, the second thing that I realized was that it wasn't only possible to recover a lot of family stories, uh, but it was also possible to recover their stories in remarkable detail. So, uh, it, you know, I, uh, we, with the Gibsons, the Spencers, and the Walls, I, I found things like real estate listings that described, you know, people's houses down to the side. Uh, I found family letters talking about how big their shirt collars were. You know, and in the 1850s, uh, the shirt collars were, were enormously huge. Uh, Elvis has nothing on these shirt collars. So instead of compiling facts and figures about how many people crossed the color line, where and when, uh, it seemed possible to move beyond the data uh, and actually focus on who these families were, uh, why they did what they did, and what the consequences were for them, uh, for their descendants, and for their communities. And that seemed important to pursue uh, because after all, uh, race is not just a set of rules or abstract sociological trends. You know, it's something that people think about uh, at the broad level of ideas, uh, but it's also something that people live every day. Uh, it, you know, it's a set of stories that people tell and retell and shape to their experience. So I decided I wanted to add another story uh, for, for people to talk about. Uh, so I narrowed my scope down to three families and decided to write this history uh, through their eyes, you know, to, to really reconstruct their time and place. Now, historians often hover a little bit above the ground uh, and give you a bird's eye view, uh, but I wanted to surrender some of that traditional omniscience uh, and really capture the rhythms and routines of their neighborhoods uh, and create a narrative that had the texture of what people saw, what they did, what they ate, you know, what they thought about, what they prayed for, uh, what they loved, and what made them angry. So how do you do that for people who lived and died more than a century ago? And I'll give you one example. Uh, Jordan Spencer uh, uh, was a poor uh, illiterate subsistence farmer in eastern Kentucky. Um, there are no pictures, as far as I can tell, that, that survive of Jordan Spencer. Um, there's one picture of a son of his, and uh, unfortunately it's a picture uh, of him in his casket. Um, uh, and I, I won't uh, uh, keep that up too long, um, but that's Jasper Spencer. Uh, and um, I, he, you know, he moved, Jordan Spencer uh, moved from uh, Clay County, Kentucky uh, to Johnson County, so in the late 1840s. What that meant was he started out in the mountains and then he moved 100 miles deeper into the mountains uh, in the late 1840s. And his complexion was unmistakably dark. And decade after decade, census takers uh, took a look at him and scrawled mulatto on their enumeration sheets. Uh, and when I came across testimony uh, about Spencer's life by his neighbors, I was intrigued by the detail uh, that he dyed his hair red. Now, one could easily conclude that he was trying to hide his identity. You know, this is passing for white you know, in its barest form as masquerade, dyed his hair red. But a narrative account of this grooming decision uh, suggests something more complicated. So how did a man dye his hair uh, 160 years ago? Uh, the technology uh, was not uh, what it was like today. Uh, he probably rinsed his hair with a concoction rendered from the bark of chestnut and hickory trees that grew on his property. Uh, he actually uh, bought his property from a tanner uh, who used those trees uh, to dye leather. And so he could rinse his hair, it would turn red, uh, but every time he sweat, 
his sweat would run red. And Spencer was a man who did grueling work. Uh, uh, he, he, you know, he did uh, he work on his land. Uh, he did work in town. Uh, he farmed and logged on steep mountainsides. Uh, he broke horses. Uh, he did construction labor. He prided himself on being able to carry a heavy load. So it's no understatement to say that he spent most of his days sweating. So just about every time a neighbor saw him, it was an occasion to be reminded that Spencer dyed his hair. You know, if he was trying to disguise himself, he wasn't fooling anyone. Yet, dyeing his hair seemed to shift how his neighbors thought about and categorized how he looked. Uh, it became less public, you know, less about his race, and more private, you know, more of a, a function of his personal habits, uh, which his neighbors would remember decades later as very particular. So shifting my focus from Spencer to his hair dye uh, enabled me to grasp how race could function less as an objective fact uh, than what we could call a set of shared subjectivities. You know, certainly Jordan Spencer's community could see what made him different. You know, his sweat ran red. Uh, he had dark skin. Uh, his hair uh, may even have been frizzly. Uh, uh, a neighbor remembered that um, uh, even though he combed it down slick, uh, he could never keep it from laying a little in waves. But Spencer's neighbors could agree to decide that he was simply a dark white man. Now, he, what, taking these families together, uh, the Gibson, Spencers, and Walls, uh, one thing that I learned uh, was that becoming white didn't necessarily conform to what we think of as a conventional narrative of passing for white. You know, one requiring total change of identity, abandoning family, constantly fearing betrayal. You know, what we might see in uh, Philip Roth's The Human Stain or uh, uh, you know, the movie Imitation of Life. Uh, what I found is that often communities knew that certain people were racially ambiguous, but still accepted them as white, you know, even at times of great racial polarization and violence. But these were not islands of racial tolerance. Uh, you know, and this isn't really a happy story. You know, the communities and their newest members could be just as committed to white supremacy as anywhere and anyone else. Communities could live with racial ambiguity, you know, function with open secrets, accept people who were known to be somehow different. And they could even articulate ideas that come very, very close to today's chestnut, that race is a social construction. But they were still very much within the mainstream of the Jim Crow South. You know, one could say that a central question underlying the history of race in the US is how people could structure their lives, their communities, their politics, uh, and culture around racial categories, even when they repeatedly acknowledged, quite candidly, that the categories were incoherent. You know, when we try to grasp how this managed to happen, you know, how the, the social construction of race uh, isn't necessarily a concept uh, that requires a uh, progressive valence. One way we can understand this is by thinking about racial categories as a legal regime, uh, a set of rules, formal or otherwise. So the family stories in the invisible line show how the law established and supported racial divisions in the US. Uh, it, you know, the law always played a central role in how we understand race. Uh, but the messy realities of everyday life uh, were continually trumping and reshaping even the most clear-cut rules. Uh, often, uh, it, uh, courts uh, would uh, make it very difficult to reclassify people who had been living as white. 
uh, judges interpreted statutes in ways that minimized their intrusion into the daily routines of communities, uh, even when there was ample evidence uh, that communities were allowing people of color to become white. Uh, and in a way, uh, if the courts took too hard a line, then countless whites would have been vulnerable to reclassification. Uh, and uh, people were kind of candid that uh, you, you know, something would come unraveled uh, in the South uh, if this line were too zealously policed. And the tragic irony of this is that by making white communities secure in their status, you know, by minimizing the worry that they could be reclassified, the South was able to commit all the more to segregation, white supremacy, and the idea of white racial purity. You know, the idea that, I, I'll, I'll wrap up now so we can have some time for discussion. Uh, you know, the idea that, that race is blood-borne, uh, that it's grounded in science, I mean, it still has incredible power over how we think about ourselves and how we order our worlds. And you know, even in our uh, post-racial era, uh, race remains an incredibly potent political tool and dividing line. But once we understand that African Americans were continually crossing the color line and establishing themselves as white you know, throughout American history, across the country, you know, it requires us to, to think twice uh, about what the categories of black and white mean. You know, black blood uh, can't be what makes a person black. Uh, you know, after all, plenty of white people uh, have black blood, too. And as I wrote The Invisible Line, I was left wondering whether race has meaning outside of the inequality that it presumes. You know, is race just a bare proxy for hierarchy and discrimination? Uh, you know, is it something uh, along the lines of what the great African-American scholar W.E.B. Du Bois once said? Uh, he said, uh, people ask me, what is a black man? Uh, and I answer that, uh, uh, that's, that's an easy question. Uh, the black man is the person who has to ride the Jim Crow car through Georgia. I think with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you very much. Sure. So there's been some wonderful scholarship about um, uh, e e Latino civil rights uh, history and um, uh, e you know the the you know what people will call the strange career of Juan Crow uh, as opposed to Jim Crow uh, and uh, there uh, e and in certain ways it was a little bit different uh, because the. Uh, the uh, treaty, the treaties, um, uh, you know, treaties like the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, gave uh, uh, people who uh, had been uh, Mexicans uh, uh, the same status as whites. Uh, so people would say, uh, in places like California, uh, yes, we uh, discriminate against, uh, uh, you know, we discriminate against Mexicans, uh, but legally they're white. Uh, we're just discriminating them against them. It's not about race, it's about language. Right? It's about nationality. Uh, and you know, the struggle for civil rights for Latinos uh, actually often involved the dilemma uh, of do we analogize to the African American civil rights struggle uh, or uh, do we try to distance ourselves as much as possible uh, from the African American experience and really uh, stake our claim as, as white people. Uh, and uh, you, know, you see people going back and forth uh, 
uh, over time. Uh, Native American history, um, you know, there's a very long history of uh, racial dynamics within, uh, uh, and you know, the role of uh, racial dynamics in, in Native American identity and, and tribal membership. And there was uh, an 1806 uh, Virginia Supreme Court case where uh, uh, a family, uh, uh, grandmother, uh, her daughter, and granddaughter uh, were about to be, were, were slaves, they were about to be sold south. And they went to court saying, uh, we're not black, we're Native American, uh, we're, we should be legally free. And, uh, you know, big trial, uh, uh, and they, they wound up being freed. Uh, and the presumption uh, that a person who is Native American was free, uh, that a person who looked African American uh, was presumptively a slave, uh, you know, in many ways, uh, laws like this drove a powerful wedge uh, between Native Americans and African Americans. Uh, and you see in uh, the southeastern U.S., uh, Native American tribes are, you know, decimated, and uh, uh, there's uh, all kinds of family alliances that are created with uh, other free people of color. But then periodically, uh, when the outside world looks at Native American land and, and would say, uh, we can take this land because they're not Native American, they're, they're really all black now. Uh, what you see are these histories of periodic purges uh, from, uh, and redefinition of who's Native American, uh, where people with darker skin are cast out uh, and uh, people with lighter skin remain in. Um, uh, it, you know, this, uh, it, you know, you can still see this uh, today uh, with, uh, it, you know, tribes that um, uh, are, you know, in places like Oklahoma uh, that are trying to determine tribal membership. Uh, a lot of this was also reinforced by uh, the kinds of uh, censuses that uh, uh, Indian Bureau officials took uh, when uh, tribal reservations were carved up and, and allotted to individual Native Americans uh, in the 1890s. Um, you know, so these rules divided blacks and Native Americans. Um, at the same time, uh, one could also say these rules turned many African Americans into Native Americans uh, because there is a, uh, uh, a way to be, uh, uh, to be dark skinned uh, but uh, not uh, have the legal disability uh, that was consigned to blackness. Surprise that one a, a black someone who's who's black who goes on the show and says surprise that they that they have white ancestry because they always thought that they were Native American. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of flipped in that in fact there's in, in you know at least the last let's say 40, 50 years there's been a trend towards the idea that having one drop of, of white blood is, is worse in fact than than having mm -hmm. a, a drop of Native American blood. Um, so it's it's I, I, I think I think how Native Americans have kind of been a space where both races have shown that they're either, you know, uh, embracing the other or not is a mm -hmm. really interesting one. And the red hair might actually um, perhaps comes from um, the idea that red hair is more associated with Native American traits mm -hmm. than would be associated with black traits. Because um, there's, I mean, certainly a, I mean, I, I know, well, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, no, I, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, an interesting comment, and, you, you know, everywhere you go, uh, uh, you, you know, I mean, really, everywhere you go, you find people who claim descent from Native Americans. Uh, so when I was um, in Johnson County, Kentucky, I uh, couldn't resist but, but go to Butcher Holler and see the Loretta Lynn home place. Uh, I don't know, if you, if you haven't seen Coal Miner's Daughter, it's... Uh, you, you know, I'm from Nashville, so I have to say it's the best movie ever made. Um, and 
Uh, so I went to Butcher Holler. Uh, uh, Loretta Lynn's brother, uh, Herman, runs the general store and gives the tours of the house. Uh, and you know, Herman was showing me around the house, and um, uh, you know, it's where uh, uh, the movie was filmed. And on the wall, there's a picture of uh, you know, a, a woman who uh, uh, had a dark complexion. I said, oh, who's that? And they said, oh, uh, that was our grandmother. Uh, you know, she was Cherokee. And you know, all over the South, you find people who uh, you know, claim Cherokee ancestry. And I mean, certainly plenty of people do. And, and the Trail of Tears came through. Um, but uh, you know, people have done studies of this. And, and there are definitely uh, you know, way more Cherokee grandmothers than uh, there ever were Cherokees. <laughs> right? And so you know, these kinds of uh, intermediate categories, uh, it, you know, I mean, in a way, um, uh, it, I mean, these there was uh, you know, were were a necessary outlet uh, uh, and sort of safety valve for for these uh, very rigid and uh, uh, you know unreal categories of black and white. And all over the South, you find uh, people who uh, were neither black nor white, but something else. You know, so in um, uh, Tennessee, uh, the, uh, there's a group called the Melungeons, right, in, in the mountains, uh, who are uh, not black, they're not white, no one knows, you know, no one knew quite what they were. Uh, and they claim their origins to be, you know, in the 1870s, uh, uh, there was a trial, uh, were they black, were they white, and the claim was they were Phoenician. Um, and uh, in, um, uh, in Maryland, uh, there was a group called uh, the Weasorts. Uh, they weren't black, they weren't white, they were Weasorts. Uh, and supposedly the name was because a matriarch of the family uh, would always talk about Weasorts uh, as opposed to African Americans who were themsorts. Uh, and uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, Robeson County, North Carolina, uh, where uh, actually a lot of people in East Baltimore have roots. Uh, there were uh, actually four races. Uh, there, were, there was black, there was white, uh, there was Croatan, which was the category uh, before people called themselves Lumbee Indians. Uh, and then uh, there were the Smilings. And as far as I can tell, the Smilings were you know, sort of like the, the Lumbees, uh, like the Croatans, except the Croatans wouldn't have anything to do with the Smilings. The Smilings wouldn't have anything to do with, with the Croatans. Uh, not, neither of them would have anything to do with, with African Americans. Uh, so, um, it, you know, in a way, there was, uh, it, you know, in a world of black and white, uh, there had to be categories that, that enabled people to be dark white people. So you know how you—I um, uh, mean, it's a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting question, uh, and you know it's a question about uh, how we draw these lines. Uh, and in so many cases, because uh, Native American status uh, now confers a, a certain package of legal entitlements, uh, in so many ways, it's a race that is. You know, defined very formalistically through law. Uh, 
right? It's about tribal membership. It's about specific rules. Uh, no one, and in a way, uh, those rules are presumed to do all the work we need, right? So uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, runs for Senate in Massachusetts, and she comes under fire because she claims Native American ancestry, uh, but she's not specifically a tribal member, uh, and it, you know this is something. Um, uh, it, you know it's uh, very different, for example, from how uh, uh, Native Hawaiians were defined. Uh, so there was a uh, Supreme Court case that uh, uh, that dealt with a challenge uh, to who could vote on matters uh, relating to, I think it was matters relating to the Kamehameha Trust. It was a sort of a native trust and it was limited to, to people of native descent. Uh, and uh, you know, the court held that that was an impermissible uh, race, use of race. It was an impermissible discrimination. Uh, but you know, if you think about it, people voting who have Native Hawaiian ancestry, um, they're every race, right? They're people who are voting who are white, who are black, uh, who you know, thought of themselves as uh, uh, Chinese or Japanese. Uh, you, you, know, you could, in a way, it's not a race at all, right? So, you know, Native American, it, it crosses, uh, it really shows the boundary between you know, what we think of as a racial category uh, and what is much more purely a, uh, a you know, political category or uh, a category of, uh, you know, historical social experience. Yeah, um, so that's a great question. You know, there, there's a, um, uh, I, I love this uh, job combination, a conceptual artist and, uh, uh, and philosopher uh, uh, named Adrienne Piper. Uh, and she wrote an essay called uh, Passing for White, Passing for Black, uh, which was a really interesting meditation on uh, the people who uh, might uh, pass for white. And, uh, and she says something that historically is borne out, that uh, for years before people established themselves as white, uh, many of these families insist that they're black every day. You know, every day they are uh, enacting uh, their blackness because they're constantly being reflexively categorized as white. Uh, so uh, you see um, uh, I, there are uh, these um, uh, old families in Augusta, uh, Augusta, Georgia, uh, who uh, were uh, ardent civil rights activists at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and then uh, uh, a couple of the families, one went to Philadelphia and became white, one went to Los Angeles and became French. Uh, and. Uh, the stories that were told uh, were that every time they went shopping in Atlanta in the late 19th century, they would brace themselves for a screaming fight with a train conductor. Because when they got on the train in Augusta, usually the, uh, the conductor knew them and they would sit in the colored car. Uh, but when they got back on the train in Atlanta, uh, the conductor would route them to the white car and they would insist on being in the black car. Uh, the conductor would say, you have to be in the white car. And they would just have a battle over this. Uh, so you, know, you have people who are uh, ardently African-American uh, and 
Uh, and then what happened to these families was uh, they litigated a case to the Supreme Court and they lost. And in despair, uh, they sort of threw up their hands and the practice was they would move away, they would go to a realtor, uh, they would ask for, uh, ask to see houses and if the realtor took them to an African American neighborhood, fine, they would be African American. Uh, if not, they would be white. And they just would become white by keeping their mouths shut. Um, so, you know, that, that moment was, I mean, for some people, a really fraught moment. I mean, for, for other people, uh, you know, there are people who, for generations, were trying to claim white status, and then they kind of get it. Um, uh, you know, after a while, uh, you know, there's a question of, uh, you know, how aggressively is this knowledge of, of their history forgotten? Uh, and, you know, they, these are the kinds of secrets that people kind of hold on to. Uh, so there's one woman who um, uh, grew up in, uh, I, I think it's Lutherville, Maryland. Uh, so, you know, just outside of town. Uh, but her family was from Texas and Louisiana. And she has photos. She, she um, uh, wrote an article for a Baton Rouge newspaper. Um, uh, has family photographs uh, where vacationing in Galveston, Texas, uh, they would always pose by the whites only beach sign, you know, the sign that said whites only. Uh, so, you know, this was um, a family that didn't just uh, keep quiet about it, they were aggressively white. Uh, but there are also ways that the memories uh, uh, linger on. Any more questions? No? Okay, thank you guys. Oh, thank you very much.